Welcome everybody. My name is Andreas Meyer and I'm hosting the Pattern Recognition Symposium. Today I have a presentation for you by Mayank Patwari and it's entitled Learning to Denoise in Clinical Computed Tomography. Mayank, looking forward to your presentation. All right, so hi, let me begin. I'm going to talk about learning how to denoise in clinical computed tomography. This is based on my contribution at the CT meeting. So now let's get to it. Why is this a problem? Why do we need to denoise? So what we have on the left is an image with your standard amount of dose. And what we have on the right is an image with a reduced dose. As you can see in close-ups, when we reduce the dose, these tiny features here they start going missing or getting distorted. Like this thing here is just gone. It just looks like noise. So a little bit background. CT is a critical tool in diagnostic and interventional medical procedures. And the use of CT is growing year on year. The problem is CT is full of radiation, which is dangerous for the patient. One CT is equal to about 40,000 chest X-rays. Or if you're into bananas, it's the equivalent of eating 6 billion bananas. Don't do that. And almost 1% to 2% of cancers are caused due to radiation from CT. Um, this is an extrapolated number from 1% uh, 40 years ago. So I think it's a reasonable number because there's also been advancements in CT technology. Because of this, we aim to reduce the dose as much as possible for patient safety. This is called the ALARA principle as low as reasonably achievable. But reducing the dose creates noise in the resultant image, as we've showed you, and it can destroy critical features. For example, low contrast tumors or small objects, they just go missing under noise. Therefore, we need to remove noise while preserving these small low contrast filters. How is it done right now? Traditionally, we use non-linear -fil non filtering approaches like bilateral filtering or guided filtering. And these have been applied both in the projection domain and in the image domain. But computers have gotten stronger, especially in the last 20 years. And most modern scanners are using iterative reconstruction. Deep learning has been introduced in the latest generation of scanners. Canon has their Aquilon, which features AIC, and G is demoing their true fidelity in their latest model. Now, deep learning, when it's applied, it usually learns a mapping from a noisy CT image to a clean CT image. So it's image in, image out. It doesn't take into account any of the physics of the noise or anything of that sort. It doesn't learn any specific image or processing operations that we know of. And that's one of the key problems. There's many different ways to do it with residual networks or adversarial training, but whatever we do, it lacks interpretability and results can be quite unexpected. And what happens when we get unexpected results? Well, this video is not playing. Never mind. What is our approach? In our approach, instead of learning a mapping from a noisy image to a clean image, we learn how to remove noise from the image. And to remove the noise, we have a joint bilateral filter. We estimate the filter functions using Gaussian. There are two filter functions based on the bilateral filter. One smooths the difference in the intensity, and the other smooths the differences in the spatial coordinates, so how far an image is from a central pixel. The guidance image of the joint bilateral filter is estimated using a deep neural network. And we tune the parameters using a parameter tuning network. Now, it sounds like this doesn't really solve the problem of interpretability. But let me explain in more detail. Our core denoiser here is the joint bilateral filter. It needs a prior image. That's why it's joint bilateral. And we estimate this prior by putting in a noisy image through a deep neural network and getting a somewhat clean image. 
Now, if we use that directly, that would again contribute to the interpretability problem, which is why we prefer to use it as just a guidance image. For each point in the bilateral filter, there's two sigma parameters, sigma i and sigma s. For parameter optimization, we put in the noisy image. And then for each pixel, we allow it to tune the parameters of sigma i and sigma s. And once we give it the five tuning steps, we filter our image, put it through a quality network to see how good the image is. If we think that you know it's reached an optimal quality or if the quality is not good enough, we can always iterate the process again. So we filter it again, estimate another prior image, tune the parameters again from scratch. How do each of these components work? Let's talk first about our denoiser network. So our denoiser network is a residual CNN which has 32 filters in each layer of 3 into 3 into 3, and it uses a leaky ReLU nonlinearity. We train this separately with the data of 10 patients at four different doses at 5%, 10%, 25%, and 50% of the standard dose. Our quality network has eight convolutional layers, and in the end, it outputs a single number, a quality score, which can range between zero and one. And this quality score was trained using a structural similarity metric. Next, our parameter tuning network. Now, this is the more interesting one. So this is a network we tune, you train using reinforcement learning methods. We do that. This network has to choose one of the two parameters, sigma s or sigma i. And then it chooses which of the possible actions to take, whether we should reduce or um, increase the parameter and by how much. Now, for this reinforcement learning training, we anyways make it uh, iterate thousands of hundreds of thousands of times. So the amount of training data is just 16 image slabs of 16 into 256 into 256. Does this work? What do our results look like? Well, here's a sample image. On the left, we have our low dose CT image, and on the right, we have our standard dose CT image. And in the middle, we have our ablation studies. So B is just the joint bilateral filter without parameter tuning. C is our current reinforcement learning method, but without using the quality CNN. We instead use a score of how close it is to a ground truth image. And D is our method using parameter optimization and the quality network. And as we can see clearly, the closest of them, also shown by the structural similarity score, is your standard dose CT image, is our method. And as for the quantitative comparisons, we compare it not only to our ablation studies, but also to a couple of state-of-the-art methods, CPCE3D and our, which is a residual network, and GAN, a generative adversarial network. And we find that our method is the best at structural similarity. While pure joint bilateral filtering produces a better signal to noise ratio, the structural similarity index is lower, indicating that we might possibly be losing some features in the quest to eliminate noise. Overall, what have we achieved? Let me summarize. We developed a method to denoise low dose CT scans while preserving features. This method has better results than many state-of-the-art deep learning networks while having somewhat fewer parameters. We are literally tweaking just the two parameters of the filter at this point. This method is somewhat more interpretable because we know at each point it's applying a joint bilateral filter while still leveraging the power of machine learning. And future work. How do we aim to expand this in the future? One is that we could have an alternate reward function, something which includes, for example, model observers. We could also add noise removal filters in the projection domain. Right now, this is purely an image-based technique, but we could also, for example, do some denoising in the projection as well. Add more training data for the reinforcement learning task. Um, I'm quite split as to, what to the, as to the benefit of that because as we uh, give more options, we're already generating more data on the fly. So I'm not sure how helpful that will be. And the last point would be to experiment with different reconstruction kernels and slice thicknesses. So right now we just use a single re we just use a single reconstruction kernel, the B40 reconstruction kernel, and we use a slice thickness of one millimeter. 
does it behave differently when we have thicker slices or when we have sharper kernels? That would be interesting to find out as well. So thank you, that's what I've got to share. But I also think that um, just showing this talk is not enough. And therefore I made a digital poster for the CT meeting, which I've shared in the chat. So I hope you guys will have some time to look at that as well. Thank you.